<laughs> bless you, bless you, bless you. I'm, I'm going to do a quick little uh, survey if I could. Okay. What I want to know is, is I'm going to ask you some really weird, weird questions. Okay. How many of you here, if you were given to the ability to go on an all expense paid cruise, would eat a live cricket? Whoa, those are the parents of the teenagers. <laughs> Hold the butt wings off of a beautiful butterfly for the same cruise. They, these are the parents of the three-year-olds. They really do care. There we go. <laughs> you'd take care of the but butterfly after, you'd squish it or what? Oh, well, bless you, bless you, those of you here to be able to learn about your children and your grandchildren and, and to be able to learn also about how we can help our, our children as they go through this grieving process. Uh, I wish I'd have left a little bit more room, okay, for notes, but I, I hope that you'll take some notes. And I want you to take one little note, and then I want you to star it maybe four or five times. I want you to know that children grieve, but children don't grieve the same as adults. Okay? Okay. You need to, need to understand that children grieve and they don't grieve at the same as adults grieve. And, and they're, they're, they're totally different. And, and we're going to go through the differences so that, that you will know. All right. And, and we're going to start with the youngest. Is there any, any of you here have three-year-old or younger? Got one is all. Okay. We're going we're gonna to work really, really fast with you. And if you need more time, come grab me during lunch or something. Would you do that? Because those of you that have four-year-olds and younger, three-year-olds and younger, the four-year-olds are right on the border. The three-year-olds and younger, you have to understand that they will have no memories of their, in, in this case, they will have no memories of their mother as time goes on. Right now they will, next year they will, and then those memories start to fade. And what we know is that the only memories that these youngsters have, these little ones have, is what you teach them, okay? And, and what you give to them. And so the thought that I want you to understand and know is that first of all, with your little one, I would go, and if it was me, I would go and make a little video app, a little something that they could watch that has the pictures of them and their mother, in, in your case. And, and put it to music that they will like. And then as time goes on, that music may change, but the pictures won't change. And then what I'd ask that you do is that when you're with your in-laws and when you're with your parents and when you're with the siblings and when you're with friends and those sorts of things, that what you do literally is you go and you, you write down memories. So when you go to, to have family outings and things, take your phone and actually record the stories that they will talk about with your, about your wife. And as you talk about those things and you record those things, you can then put it, in, put it into digitally. And so that as time goes on, that child will have memories of their mother and the stories that will be told about their mother. And those, those things are really, really important. And, and that's where they, they glean and that's where they know. And then in the future, starting this year, then what I'd also do is I would also, and I'm, I'm now going to jump into all children, okay, what I'd also do is go create a new tradition that either you have on their birthday or you have on their death day, okay, and you have a tradition so that there will be a day designated every year that we come together and we're able to spend just a little bit of time and be able to tell stories and celebrate the life of their, their mother or their father for the rest of you. Does, does that make sense? Because what happens is, is we don't have those traditions and we, when we don't have those traditions, then memories are lost. Okay? Does that make sense to all of you? And so I, what I'm asking you all to do is find ways that you can have traditions. 
Now, in my family, you have to understand that my mom and my dad, they're the ones that have died in my life, okay? My wife's mom and father in their life. We created traditions. And, and one of the traditions that we had is that it, we, we just barely built a new, brand new home when my, my wife's mother had passed away. And so every year for, I can't remember how many years, we just barely recently stopped, we would go and plant a tree. And, and our, our yard now has lots of trees throughout our yard. And then the last time we went is we went and we bought a, a swing and, and we put it underneath some of the trees in the shade. And, and that's, that's grandma's swing. And all of our children know about grandma's swing. Okay, and, and we, we do those sorts of things. With my parents, horrible tradition, okay, for those of you that, that aren't going to like what I'm about to say, but my dad's very favorite place to eat was Chakarama. So every year, and, and that's tomorrow, but me and my wife will go celebrate it tonight. On the 12th of, of March, we go to Chakarama. Okay, I'm not a Chakarama fan, but my dad loved Chakarama. And so you do little traditions just to be able to do. And so tonight, when I leave here, I'm raising home. We're meeting all three of my children and their spouses and my grandchildren, and we're going to Chukarama tonight as a big family to celebrate Grandpa's passing and his life. And we'll spend time telling funny stories about Grandpa, okay? Because none of our grandchildren knew him. Our oldest grandchild was actually born uh, on the day that we buried my father. So you, you have those little traditions. So going back to the three-year-old, okay, you make those special days, you have new hopes and dreams, children grieve, and, and they're going to miss mom, and they're going to be sad. And so what you do is you just always, always, always with those little three-year-olds, and then I'm going to say the same thing for four, five, six, seven-year-olds, okay, you do the very same thing is that when they're going through their sad and they're grieving, literally allow them to grieve and allow them to cry and allow them to, to have sad moments. And like most little children, those sad moments won't last a very long time. You might get 30 minutes of sad, maybe. And the next thing you know, phew, is they're off. And especially with three-year-olds, you can change, literally, you can change their moods and their feelings by distracting them in a matter of moments. But it's good to let them have sad times and it's a good time to let them miss mom because those feelings are real. Okay, we're now going to go from the three to the 10-year-old. Okay, realize that three-year-olds or four-year-olds, 10-year-olds, the four-year-olds will grieve a little bit, the five-year-olds a little bit more. But when they get to start into second grade, and especially as they start moving up on down the road, one thing that you have to understand is that there's this little piece of a, of a child's mind, their cognitive development where they don't know the difference between fact and fiction until usually somewhere in their ninth, 10th, or 11th year. Depends upon their emotional uh, development. Okay, when I'm talking about they don't know the difference between fact and fiction, understand that there's, oh, okay. For those of you that believe in Santa Claus, please plug your ears, okay? They believe in Santa Claus, they believe in the Tooth Fairy, they believe in the Easter Bunny. And when they start to get to that point where all of a sudden they're questioning you about Santa Claus and they're questioning you about the Easter Bunny, their mind now is starting to shift over from facts or from fiction life to facts life, okay? And so that, that happens in this age group. And so for them, you have to understand is that for the littlest, littler ones, they're going to go through this thing where people die, but yet they come back to life. You got to go and look and see how many cartoons they've read, watched, how many roadrunners have been destroyed, and all of a sudden the roadrunner is back doing it again. You, you got to look and see that that stuff is, is plays in. But as they get older, then the facts start to, to do, and they, they, they grab on. Now, from children about eight years old up, these children usually grieve very, very quickly, okay? In other words, they have their, their mom or their dad will die and they will have the funeral and they go in and literally they don't know. 
Hey, they won't go to school and tell their friends that their dad died unless they're sometimes little girls do, but little boys very seldom. They will go to school and they won't tell their teacher. Okay, they will go and, and, and nobody will know because they don't want to be different. Does that make sense to you? And so you've got to watch these little kids and understand that as they're going through this stuff, as they're going through this, now they, they grieve differently and they just, don't, they just want to be back to normal. But they have their times of grieving. Now, we know that for most children, they grieve more the second year than they grieve the first year. And this is really, really hard on you parents. A, because you're gone through and your child hasn't grieved hardly at all. And the next year as they start to grieve, they're going to come and they're going to start their grieving process and they're behind you. And it's going to trigger you and you're going to want to say, what the heck? Okay, just know then that you've got to be able to, to let them grieve. And that's where you, you need to be able to get to your children and be able to, to be grieving with them. Now, two things to write on your page. Number one, your children will learn to grieve by watching you. Your children will learn to grieve by watching you. If you don't grieve and you don't allow yourself to cry and you don't allow yourself to have sad feelings, guess what your children won't allow themselves to do? There's a wonderful book out there that says uh, feelings buried alive, okay, what's, help me, never die. I'm here to tell you that's true. That's true. I, I deal monthly. I have new people come in monthly. Okay, that they've gone and, and their fathers, their mothers have died. They've lost that attachment to their, their parents. And because they didn't grieve, they're now back into the grieving process, even 15, 20 years later. And so I'm, I'm asking you to allow yourself to grieve and let your children see you grieve. But they don't want to have you see you crying all the time. Okay, and so you got to do it moderately. Okay, let them see it when you're feeling bad and your child comes to you because they will notice you're feeling bad today, mom, dad, are you sad today? They're going to notice it and let them know that, yes, I am. So it gives them permission to also grieve. So far, so good? Okay, yes, sir. Yes. And okay. now the second thing that I want to teach you is a concept. How many of you here have love languages? Hey, okay. I'm how many have not? Okay, let me give you just a little quick lesson on the love languages. Now, I want you to pay attention to these love languages because you see the next piece of the grieving process has to do with a making an attachment to your child, okay? What they are going through, the same thing that you're going through, only it's a little bit different. We call it uh, attachment trauma, when a child loses their parent. That's what we call it. And in today's world, we've got a couple of you here that are young enough to have little babies. Okay, we do things different in, in baby and in birthing of babies than we did even 10 years ago. Okay, my, my children have all had babies in the last three years. And it was really, really interesting to me because in, in the, last, the last babies that we just had, the last round of babies we had, because all my siblings, like one has one and then the next two, they jump right on board and have some more. Okay, what, what happens now is, is that they call up the grandparents and say, hey, we're going to go have the baby come see us a couple hours after it's born. Have any of your grandparents had somebody tell you that yet? If they, they haven't, they will. 
And what they do is they go in and the baby is born and they take that brand new little baby and it has no clothes on it. They take away the, 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 the garment part of it and they lay that little baby on its mother's, on its, on her chest. Okay, and they let that mother hold that baby and cuddle that baby and coo that little baby. And it's an attachment now that is being given to a brand new baby. We know that that's very, very important. And then they go and they take the dad and they say, okay, take your shirt off. And they, they put that little baby there and the dad now cuddles that little baby. There's an attachment that's being formed. And those children need that attachment. Note that even without that stuff that we're doing now, babies go and they attach to their mothers, they attach to their dads. And when mom and dad die, that attachment now is broken. And the reason I want to tell you and talk to you about the love languages, because you see, you have to fill in and make sure the attachments still go forward. Okay, even though they've lost an attachment to a very significant person in their life. Does, does that make any sense? So very quickly, let me talk to you about the love languages. I'm going to go through them quick. Touch me. Touch me children or children that need to be touched. They need the hugs. They need the squeezes. They need the snuggles. They need to sit on your lap. You know these kids because they're the ones that are actually going to come and sit on your lap and want to snuggle. These are the kids that want to, to, to touch you. And little ones, you know, two, three, four, five-year-olds, they're going to sit there and they're going to play with your face and they're going to play with your ears and, and they, they, they want to touch your body. Uh, this morning, my, I, I, my daughter is living with, because their family just come from Vegas and he got a new job and they still haven't been able to sell a house in Vegas. And so they're living with us and they got this little three and a half, four-year-old. And this morning she come in and she, she, she said to me, Grandpa, can we just snuggle? Okay, I'm, I'm her snuggle buddy. And then I got dressed and I got ready to leave and she kept running in and she says, don't go, don't go, don't go. And she grabbed on my leg and she wrapped her legs and her arms around my leg. And of course I drug her halfway around the house and she's laughing and giggling. She's a touch me person. They need that. For those of you that have teenagers from 10 to on up, they, well, about eight, nine years old, they, even the ones that are snugglers and want to touch, they sometimes think it's weird that, that, you know, and their friends make fun of them if I'm going to go snuggle with mom or dad. These are the kids that will want to wrestle. They will want to play basketball and push you all over. They'll play soccer and bump into you and knock you down. These are the kids that, you know, as you go through this age group, you know, they're touch me. My old son is a touch me person. And he used to come home off his dates. He would not allow his mother to hug him. He wouldn't, definitely wouldn't allow me to hug him. But literally, he would come in off his dates at, on, coming in at night, and he would get, lay on the bed, and he'd roll over the top of us as we're under the covers. He was doing that because guess what he needed? He needed the touch. I remember just a day or so before we went, he went off on this mission. And he, I know that he needed a hug and a squeeze from his dad. And I'm walking along the couch and he hit me so hard. It flipped me over the couch. I'm laying on the floor and he's on top of me, pounding the top of my head. Okay, saying, name 50 fruits. Okay, he wanted to wrestle. What he really wanted is he wanted to touch, but that's the only way he needed, he knew how to get it. So look at that. So as you're seeing these touch me kids, because they need that physical touch. And for you dads, Okay, I know that it's awkward, but I'm here to tell you that if you've got a touch me child, you keep on touching them until they die or you die. Okay, because so many times dads, and I'm telling you, so many times the dads go on through this world and all of a sudden what you do is the child turns eight, nine years old and it feels awkward to hold on and hug and squeeze your daughters. Okay. Don't quit. The number one thing, the number one thing of a child, a, a girl is the love of her father that determines her self-esteem, just so you know. Okay? And so don't quit touching them. And if anybody tells you you're weird, just look at them and say, my therapist told me that I could hug my daughter anytime I wanted. And you tell them where they can go because you need to still touch and you need to give your children hugs. Okay? Same thing your grandpa's. Find the ones that do. The second is what we call a words of affirmation, or I call them tell me people. Tell me people are people that need to be told that they're loved. You need to notice them. You need to compliment. You need to see the things that they're doing. And they need to have those daily confirmations, at least 15 a day. 
all right? These are the kids that like to tell their story and they like to talk. And for those of you that aren't tell me people, you don't understand that they just need to hear their voice going, all right? And they need to tell their story. And you're waiting for the punchline and waiting for the punchline and waiting for the punchline and it never comes, okay? They're the kids that are the tell me's. They also need you to tell your story. Okay. My little grandson, I had one over the other night, we're tending him, and he is a tell me person, and me and my wife are tuned in to this love language stuff. And so we're over there, and we're talking, and what are you doing, Adam, and what did you do today? And boom, and he just took off, and he went on for about 15 minutes. And then at the end, because he knows that we know, know what he does, he turned to my wife, and he says, Grandma, what did you do today? Guess what he's expecting? He's expecting grandma to tell her story of what she did today. And that's what I'm, I'm asking you. You gotta tune into these things. The next one is what we call an acts of service person. An acts of service person is a person that's constantly doing things for you to show you that they love you. My little eight-year-old granddaughter who lives with us right now, she's an acts of service person along with a touch me person. She's, she's both. But she's the little girl that comes in every day, okay, and she wants to help cook breakfast. This morning, guess who helped me cook French toast? She's eight. Okay, on Sundays, when we set a table at our house, guess who's setting the table? Guess who's putting on the tablecloth? She's going and she's doing that even before we go to church. She's a little acts of service person. She wants to constantly be helping us, okay? Last summer when they moved in with us, I'm mowing the lawn. Guess what she wants to do? And I don't know if it's acts of service or because grandpa has a riding lawnmower and she just wanted to drive. <laughs> I'm not sure, but she stands on, in front of me on that little riding mower and she's driving the lawnmower, but she always wants to help. You know them because they're little helpers. And as they get to be teenagers, it eh, just depends on the day, okay? <laughs> but most of the time they do. Next type of person is what we call a gifts person. And a gifts person is a person who loves to give or loves to receive or both. Going back to grandchildren, because that's who I see right now a lot of, is I've got a couple of grandchildren that are gifts people. And they come to my house and they bring me rocks with I love you on them. They bring me notes with I love you on it. Okay? They pick me flowers and they bring them in. Well, not me. They're picking grand grandma flowers, but they bring in. But they're doing little acts of gifts. And, and what it lets you know is it lets you know that they're thinking about you. So you give them little gifts. You don't have to go out and buy tons of toys and you don't go out and buy them clothes and, and you don't have to do that. But when Christmas comes around and those things, you really focus in on the gifts, but you give them the little things. You give them a rock or you give them a note or you go and you go steal neighbor's flowers and you pick them and, and put them in a glass and give them to them. And so they're getting little gifts. Okay, the next one is we call a quality time person. And a quality time person, and this is the hardest one on you folks, just to let you know, a quality time person is a person that needs one-on-one -on -one time with just you. Okay? You will know a quality time person because they will be jealous of everything that you do and they will be jealous of everything that you do with other people. They will be jealous of your cell phone. They will be jealous of the other children. They will be jealous of your work. They'll be jealous of your church calling. Anything that you're doing, they will become jealous of it because if you can go do it that with, with them, why can't you do it with me? The hard part on you is that you probably have other children. And it's really, really, really hard to have one-on-one -on -one time with that child. They really need it. And so that's the kind of things where you say, I'm going to the grocery store why don't you come with me? Or I'm going to run this air and come go with me. Or I'm going to go walk around the block, come go with me. And then you leave the other kids home if you can. 
The last one, because there is six languages of love. The last one is what we call a food person. Okay? And a food person is a person that loves to have food. They love to be, have those snacks. They love to have those little food things. And they love to, to be able to enjoy it with not only themselves, but with others. And they like to bring people together and they like to do the food eating. Most of the time, they like to eat what they like to eat. Okay? And so as you tune into these love languages, What's happening now is that you're speaking their language. Because what happens in, in this world that you're in is you have to understand that all of you are hurting, okay? And all of a sudden you're not paying attention to the things that, that not only do you need, but your children need. And what we want more than anything that goes on in this world is when your children leave your home, you want them to leave with a good self-esteem, knowing who they are. And the way they gain that self-esteem, brothers and sisters, is by you giving them their love language, because what that's doing is it's pursuing them and it's validating them as a person. That sink in. Okay? When you're saying and speaking their language, what it's doing is it's validating them as a human being, and it means it's important. Now, understand two rules. Rule is that if you don't speak your child's love language, understand that you don't think it. Don't think it. Let me give you an example of something that, that's just happened to me this week. I, I had a little girl that came in. She's 13 years old. She was adopted when she was uh, almost five. Okay. In the beginning of her life, this little girl's mother died at birth. Her father had her for just a very short period of time, and he realized that he could take care of her. So he gave this little girl to his mother to raise. And he was killed. Now mom, mom's got him. The mother was a drug addict. Not a good combination. And that little girl eventually was taken away. Welfare went through three or four years of a step family, step homes, until somebody finally adopted her. Okay. She, her languages are food and quality time. Her step or her, her adopted mother, her language is, is hugs and squeezes and snuggles, which this little girl doesn't want any of. She was one of those little kids that if you touched her, she would have reared back and don't touch me. That's that's who she is. But her her mother, now her adopted mother, is a touch me person and she wants to just smother with hugs and squeezes and kisses and come snuggle on the couch and watch TV with me. And, and yeah, we can spend quality time with that way. But as long as she's touching, ooh, it just bugs this little girl. Her father, okay, this the dad, he is what we call an acts of service person, and he's constantly doing acts of service. And all he wants to do is he wants this little girl to come do acts of service with him. And he wants her to clean the room and he wants her to clean the house. And he wants to do this. And he wants to do this. And this little girl now is 13 years old. And I can guarantee you that she has never, not once, had her love language validated. And she's a mess. Anxiety through the roof. She's a mess. Question. I <laughs> but she said we all need to learn to be bilingual because if we don't learn it then what happens is is that they don't know that we love them you've got to speak their language that's why i'm saying these things to you so as you go through all of the ages of these kids you need to learn to love them in their love language and validate them in their language. And if you don't, then they will, they will go through and, and they won't know whether you love them or they don't. Okay? So going on to the... Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And then you start... 
Absolutely. Even if you don't want to talk to your adult children to start doing their language now, and guess what will happen? They'll feel loved. Literally tune into the language, just like a radio station on an old radio, and crank up the volume, and all of a sudden they're going to go, whoa, what have I been missing? This is good. Literally. I'm, I'm here to tell you it, it, it works miracles. Now, going back. A, 8 to 10, uh, they have times that they're going to cry. They're going to miss their moms or dads. Again, you go back and you add videos and you add DVDs and you add books, blankets. Was, should I go back and think about my children when their father died five years ago or today? And it's you're thinking about them now. You want to watch and, and, and observe them where they are right now. Okay. So going, going back, seven and older, they don't want anybody to know that their, their folks have died. They want to go back and they want to be, be deceived. And you'll be surprised this teachers may not know that the parent died or a friend will come over and they didn't know they died and or another friend of the you know the parents of a friend come over i didn't know that your husband died you know your wife died these these little kids are doing that okay children 7 10 to 17 okay as i said most of this grieving is done in the second year and there's some things that i want you now to start watching out for with these kids because again as i mentioned earlier you're 10 and older usually are now knowing the difference between fact and fiction and they understand it, but they don't understand death. Okay, it's hard for an adult to even understand death. Can you imagine what a child goes through trying to understand death and is there really life after death? And, and the question is, is going on in their minds. So a couple of things to, to look for with girls. look at is what they're doing is an attachment or a detachment towards men. Okay? If they're lacking an attachment, they will try to attach themselves to a man, whether it be grandpa or whether it be whether it be brothers or the, you know, I, I'm just telling you that they want and they need that attachment to a man. And you're looking at that and where you don't want to allow them to go, and this is where we've got to be pretty specific, is you don't want them to go and start exhibiting sexual behaviors towards men. Hey, do you guys know what I mean by that or do you need me to explain that? Do they only need them for dad dies? And if mom dies, yes. time and then they will start going and and hugging and they will grab and they will sit on the laps and start rubbing themselves in an inappropriate way it's pretty obvious for those of you that may have seen this and it's pretty obvious to see and those are the kinds of things you need to pull your little girl aside and just say honey we don't so they can still hug and squeeze you are Children get older, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. Okay, what they will do is, is they will start spending time with just one young man. And I'm, I'm here to say to you, 
that, that there's a lot of predators out there in the world and the predators start early. Predators, predators are out there. They start at 12, 13 years old, folks. This isn't something that these young boys and these things that they're predators that they wait and, and they're very sexually driven. And so, you know, if you've got a, a little girl that's, that's going and you know that they're holding hands, kissing, you know, notice those things are going on. You careful with that because they will become sexual very quickly. And the hard part, guys, is once you become sexual, you're always sexual. Okay? And we, we don't want our little girls to be taken advantage of. We don't want our teenagers to be taken advantage of. And, and that happens. And so what happens now is they get older, especially the 15, 16, 17-year-olds. Guys who are not good will try to control and consume your child. All right, they will want to be with them every night. They will want to be with them all day long. They want to be with them on weekends and they consume the child. And in the very beginnings of these consumings, they push them towards quick physical attachment. Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna throw, tell you how to combat it. Okay, and it's gonna blow your mind a little bit. It goes against everything that you think. What I do is I tell my clients to go and make sure that those children are with you and you invite them all the time to your house, but they're never alone. Okay, but you're welcome to come over, but they're never alone. And it drives the young boys crazy because guess what they want? They want to be alone. Okay, and but you're inviting them over and it drives them crazy and they will break up with the, your girl because we can never be alone. That's, that's the number one way to, to break these, these young men that are being able to consume your child. And it goes totally against everything. And so you got to be able to do that. The other thing is, is that if you allow them to have phones, and I'm not one that says give your child a phone when they're 10, 12, 13 years old. But if you do have, they do have phones, you make sure that you have track my friend on it. Find my friend on it. You have, it a, you have it a, something that's constantly tracking where your child is at so that you know, all right? And when you know, what's it called? Life 360. Life 360? Okay, the, the, just get one of those free apps. It tracks them and you know right where they're at all the time. And if you can hide the app even better, okay, does that make sense? Okay, you want to watch both girls and boys that withdraw. You want to watch them as they, they're withdrawing and they don't want to spend any time. They only want to spend time in their room. They want to, you know, the boys will go to video games. The girls will go to Snapchats and do those sorts of things. You, you want to be able to watch that. And those are signs that you need to be watching so that when they, they go and they just want to be by themselves in their rooms, that's not a good thing for them to be. And so what you're, I'm asking you to do is change that up, have them come out, have them do their homework outside in the living room, have them do it at the kitchen table, uh, invite them to do things, and then look to see what their language is and crank up the volume so that they know that you love them, they know that you're pursuing them. Now, the the boys a little bit because the boys they go in and they become consumed with their games and their game boys and their video things and their computers they become consumed with their phones okay and i'm warning you parents right now that you need to be watching what your kids are doing because there's tons and tons of predators out there and they will predator on your boys just like they will your girls and then because we feel bad as a parent, because my child is going through these terrible, horrible, rotten things, you're going to get their Xboxes and all these various things. And, and what I'm throwing at you now is limit the time. From 12 on up until they leave your home, don't allow them to play video games more than two hours a day. A, all time, computer time, TV, 
the, the recommendation from the experts is two and a half hours total time. Okay, when your boys get into the, the gaming and they get into the violent games and they will, trust me, they will. A lot of the violent games also have porn attachments to them. If you didn't know that, you need to be aware of that. They, they have that, okay? The average age of children being introduced to porn has gone from 13 to eight. Okay, I went to a conference not too many months ago and the speaker that was there, he said, I need somebody that has a phone that has blockers on it so you can't get into stuff. And this lady raised her hand and says, here you go. He had it. Within 30 seconds, this man had gone in to her internet even though she had a blocker and she had gone into a cartoon called My Pretty Pony and was into porn within 30 seconds. Kids are watching what your kids are doing. Always, 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 if they have a phone, you got to go and you got to be able to have it in your room at night when you go to bed. Hopefully, you're going to bed after your children. If you go to bed before your children, your, their phone is in your room charging, not in their room charging. And they will say, well, I have to listen to my music or it wakes me up. It's my alarm clock. Go buy them an alarm clock. Okay, don't let them have it in the room. I'm just, I'm, so these boys, though, as they pull back, understand that they go in and they become depressed and they become despondent and they become so that they're, they're not interested in life. And what we don't want them to do is we don't want them to go that room, down that room or that road. And then knowing it, it's an alcohol. Yes, sir. No, no, no. Lack of grief. Lack of grief. Fights with kids and especially your adult children for the first year. And, and when we get to adult children, which we will in about five, 10 minutes here. Okay, we're, we're going to show you how they grieve, and, and they are totally different than even your teenagers. So going, going back now, as we're moving forward and our kids are getting watch, and you, if you suspect that your child is doing drugs, it's simple to take them down to the health clinic. It's simple to take them to now care or we care and have them pee in a cup, and you'll know exactly what they're doing. Okay. Questions there because we do need to move on because our, our time is running. Okay, let's let's talk about adult children then for the last five minutes. So we got adult children. You have to understand that your adult children are are, are they're they're sad and and they will grieve differently. Uh, my experience is is that the girls, your daughters, and those they, they will be if it's it's their mother that they're grieving and even their dad they're grieving they will grieve. And they will feel bad and they will feel sad and they will go through the grievings. Understand that most of the guys, they're tough and we're only allowed to have a few feelings. And one of those feelings is sad. And so they will go and be tough and they will move forward. They will start to grieve, all right, if you start to date. That's when they will start to grieve. And they will come to you and they will say things like, uh, don't, didn't you love mom? And they will guilt you and they will shame you thinking that you didn't love their mother, those sorts of things. And so you got to look and see that their grieving takes place very, very quickly, but it really they don't grieve the whole thing and they will start to grieve when you start to date. Now, for those of you that are interested in going and dating, there's a couple of things that I would encourage you to do, not only with your adult children, but with all your children, is first, okay, let them know that you're thinking about dating when you start to think about dating, okay, because it prepares them, and they will start to think about it, and they will start to ponder it, and so it's important for them to know that I'm going in that direction. And then what I would do for the adult children is 
talk to them and then say, do you guys have any questions? Normally you're questions and they're gonna ask why. And, and what you're gonna say is, well, I'm lonely. I mean, let's just be honest, I'm lonely, okay? You, you're, you need to be able to say every night you guys get to go home to somebody, every night I go home by myself. And every morning when I wake up, I'm by myself. And yes, you kids are wonderful. You, you have me over for dinner all the time or you have me over here all the time, but I'm lonely. And you go down that direction so that you're warning your children. Now, just a bad story. I had a, a gentleman who, who never let his kids know that he was dating. He went out, fell in love with another lady. And then he called his children and said, I want to take you on a dinner cruise on the Great Salt Lake. <laughs> Did you guys know that there's a dinner cruise on the Great Salt Lake? There is. And you can go and charter it. And it'll take you out. And they'll take you around the, the Great Salt Lake on this boat. And they feed you dinner. And so they went out on this cruise with their dad and his fiance that the kids knew nothing about. And the boat captain married them that night. Oh. Bad. Bad dad. Okay. So what I'm saying is that you, you let your children know that you're thinking about dating. And then when those of you that have small children and teenagers, them to a future, a future man that you're dating or a woman you're dating until you, that it's going to go somewhere. Because the small children and even some of your teenagers will become attached to the man of dating, and when you break up with them, it'll be like another death. And with small children, sometimes it's worse than the death of their, their father or their mother. Because they, they now have an attachment. And so I'm warning you on the child, small children, don't let them meet. On the older children, when you start to date and you found somebody that you like, then you need to bring them in. Children. Now, another bad dad. Okay, because I have another gentleman that I worked with and he went down this road and you would have thought that he'd be smart enough because he went and he told his children that he was dating, which was a good thing, but he never let this lady come and do anything that the children would be involved with. They didn't get to come, she didn't get to come on Sunday dinners and, and once a month he had a big Sunday dinner. She never got to come to any of the holidays, the Christmas, the, the Thanksgiving. She never got to go. He was a big Utah or University of Utah fan and they had season tickets to football. She was never allowed to do any of that stuff. And so as he went down this road and he married her, guess what the children would not allow her to do? Anything with them. We have traditions at Christmas, and, and you're not part of the tradition. You can't come. Guess how long the marriage lasted? Now, when you choose to marry someone, okay, you have to understand that second marriages, there's about a 72% chance of divorce if, okay, if you don't follow what I'm just trying to teach you. The number one reason for divorce of second marriages isn't because two people don't love each other. It's because of children. You know, you had a question. You remember what it was? Yeah. Questions and the men don't. <laughs> let, me, let me ask a question and it's your turn. For men, what we find is that usually about eight months after a spouse passes away, For women, it's it's longer, and at least a year to, to start to date, date. That, that doesn't mean you can't go hang out, and you can't go to parties, and you can't do things with the opposite sex. It's just that, that we don't go and do one-on-ones. Later today, for those of you that want a good laugh, come and, and let me talk to you about the do's and the don'ts of dating, because that's going to be a fun class. Okay. And so basically what, what we're doing now is you're warning the children, they will start to grieve, and then you have to let them go through their grieving. For your adult children going through that, when you guys start to go down those roads, your adult children will grieve relatively fast. It'll take about three months. 
but they, they do have to go through the grieving. They do have to wrap their head around it. And because their cognitive development is much better than a 17 or even younger, they go faster. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 